Ah! This week, the start of our four-part Western series, we're going to review Tombstone, a 1993 picture from Hollywood Pictures. And if you want a review to remember, we are your Huckleberry. Come on, Joe. Well, I don't know about you, Joe, but oh my God, all that horseback riding wore me out. Oh, oh Lord. My so, butt is killing me, Deb. I know, and I'm all sweaty now from all that riding out on the plains. But let's tell people about Tombstone. Yes. And I'm going to start with the plot so people know. It's about the notorious Wyatt Earp, played by Kurt Russell, and he has plans to retire with his two brothers, played by Sam Elliott, who's in almost every Western, and Bill Paxton, who people should know had an untimely death. He was a great guy. Anonymously, they want to retire in the town of Tombstone, Arizona. But once in the town, he meets with his old friend Doc Holliday, played by Val Kilmer. And they're disrupted by ruthless outlaws that in his past he was famous for eliminating and leading to the gunfight at the OK Corral. And you know what? If people are interested in seeing this film, not only can they stream it, but check out Amazon because you could buy this film and check out where you could find it all on Amazon. Right. Amazon has pretty much everything. So it's a great resource. That's wonderful because, you know, in this day of streaming, it gets catch as catch can. So Amazon is pretty much your standard that you can go to. So the 1990s, like a kind of a resurgence of Westerns, Westerns sort of like petered out around the late 60s, early 70s, and then sort of came back a little bit. And this was sort of a, an attempt to bring that using Wired Earp. And it seems like a lot of Westerns, you know, some of them centered around Wired Earp. He was a character that was well known within not only the United States, but you know, within the music, music excuse me, the film history. Well, the thing with about this film, which is interesting, is it came to the notice of the Hollywood studios to do a story about Wyatt Earp. And what they wanted to do was a, a screenplay first was like bandied about and Costner wanted to do it. But they scrambled and beat him to it, Hollywood Pictures, and cast this thing, which has, and I don't mean to say thing, but this film that has, we're going to a zillion people in Hollywood in it. And we're going to go into the other picture, but uh, six months later, in 1994, Kevin Costner made Wyatt Earp. And we'll do the parallels between them a bit. Yeah, and what's interesting is that, again, this focuses on Wyatt Earp, but also the infamous OK Corral scene, where the Wyatt Earp and his brothers duel it out with these cowboys that are kind of like the anti-lawmen. He comes back from being retired to being the sheriff in town. Uh, and history actually sort of mimics this movie. They did an excellent job of trying to portray what happened in history in this movie where he wants to retire. He's going to Tombstone. Tombstone was the land of silver. Supposedly there was a uh, discovery of silver and a lot of people were moving in and he wanted to get away from that, sort of settle him and his brother's lives right. in Tombstone. Yeah, he was tired of being a lawman. And he wanted to just have anonymity and go to this town with his family. Right. But the cowboys, who we always think of are the good guys, were actually the bad guys. Oh, yeah. And he wanted to, you know, it was kind of a lawless, you know, place in, in Arizona, uh, Tombstone. And they actually said historically that the cowboys, this gang of cowboys, was the first organized crime group in America. And when I dug into it, I'm like, I can't believe this. Like, I'm always thinking the Italians did it, but no, it's well, actually the Cowboys. You know. Yeah. Um, and he was there to set things straight, him and his brothers. You know, I had a hard time with this movie because, you know, when I don't, when I think of the Westerns, I think of the 50s, 60s, even the 70s. I don't think of it in the 90s genre. And you talk about the 90s, there was a resurgence of Westerns. And this was one of the one of the few that came out in the, in the beginning of the 90s. So I had a hard time watching it, but it was interesting. They didn't just end it at the OK Corral. They ended it kind of a way where, you know, yeah. White Earp had his revenge. He went after, you know, let, let's talk about the well, details. First of all, I don't like the way that OK Corral scene came three quarters into the movie. And then you had more film after that. And also between the two movies, I have to give Costner, you know, Wyatt Earp was more accurate than the Tombstone. 
Uh, well, I didn't see Wyatt Earp. I didn't see Costner's Wyatt Earp. But they claimed that because Tombstone came out before Wyatt Earp that it actually took away from the excitement of seeing Kevin Costner and Wyatt Earp, and it didn't do as well in the box office. Right. Um, so who knows? I haven't seen it. You saw it. You love Kevin Costner. I don't know. I'm, I'm not saying it just because I love Kevin. I have boyfriends mm -hmm. in every movie, right? One of my boyfriends is in this movie. All right, we're going to talk about that. All right. Hold on. So but, let's... but I want to talk about something very really interesting about right. this movie. They go into the whole um, theme of not only going back and you know trying to make a living by being a lawman, but then taking over the Oriental Saloon. And I didn't realize until later that it actually existed, that oh, yeah. Wyatt Earp, to make ends meet, because he really had nothing, he and his brothers had nothing when they moved into Tombstone. Um, yeah, there were no pensions or anything you right. know, for a lawman. Right, and then he goes into Tombstone, and he also invites, and this is true too, Wyatt, Wyatt Earp invites Doc Holliday, played by Val Kilmer. Doc Holliday is a gambler, he's kind of a drunkard, he had tuberculosis when he was 15 years old, so he suffered from that, and he was a marksman, but he really, historically, never really had a lot of kills. In the saloon that Wyatt Earp takes over, um, there's a scene with Bob Thornton, Billy Bob Thornton, where he grabs his ear. He's, you know, Billy Bob Thornton's playing part of a leader of a And of Billy a Bob's gang. kind of fat back then. Oh, yeah. He was, and best he was, friends with Bill Paxton, I must say. Yes. Um, and this was one of his first movies. Correct. That he showed himself. He didn't come to the forefront till Sling Blade. Then everybody knew Billy Bob. Right. And he was also known to um, ad-lib this whole scene. He didn't have any lines in the screenplay. Uh, in the script, and he did it basically just, the director told him, just say what you want to say. Yeah. And there's this iconic scene where Wider grabs him by his ear and drags him out of the saloon because the saloon wasn't making any money. There was, it was overtaken by this gang, brings him out and gives him a... Well, Powers Booth kind of was the big guy in the gang too. Right. The two guys were Powers Booth and Johnny Ringo. But anyway, we can go through because we have to, we have to talk a little bit about the cast okay. and not go zero one in each one because it's like not a cast of thousands, but everybody in Hollywood seemed to be in this picture. And if you know something, we're kind of dressed up. Oh my God, yes, our the, costumes. In well, the tombstone look way. Look at you, as always. You know, I got my little cowboy hat. I wouldn't call little, big hat. It's a big hat. It's well, a big it, hat. it mimics Wyatt Earp's hat. If you take a look at oh, Tombstone, yes. you notice that's a similar hat. I have my, this is my cowboy shirt. shirt. Uh, my badge, and you got your badge on too. Oh yeah, we're sheriffs, because we have to be, we're law people. And Even though I don't think they had female sheriffs, but I was pretty tough. Uh, you are tough. Because of horses. You got a set on Oh you. yeah. That's for sure. So if anyone wants to buy any of this, they can actually go on Amazon to buy any of our costumes, which there's actually a list right below in the caption section that you can go check out yeah. and uh, buy it yourself. This is great, great stuff. Well, I don't, I didn't have any of that. I actually borrowed this hat. This is like a real expensive cowboy hat from out west, oh, handmade, and this is from the Painted Desert. Oh. This little, I think, I don't know if you call it a bolero, I should have researched it, but I call bolero? it that, so I'm making it that anyway. Did you say bordero? Whatever. Olero. Olero. Okay. I don't know if it's right, and I'm sure in the comments they'll say, Debbie, you know, uh, she don't know what. But anyway, that's that. Oh, wait a minute. Deb, you you're got sweating it. me. Yeah, but you know what you're holding up? The cards. Yeah. And you know what? He held it up before, and I kind of saw a score, so I think he had to change it because he doesn't know the art of subterfuge. Well, so are you ready? I am ready. You so want to do the count? Three, two, one. Let's show it. Huh, kind of close, kind of close. Yes. But I have some, I, I, I'm, I'm like kind of feeling the this movie. A lot of people, you know, for a movie of the 90s with this stellar cast that you had an iconic classic, modern classic, Western. Let's talk about the movie. Let's talk well, I want to talk, let's, let's start a little bit with the cast because it is instrumental. Kurt Russell's the main guy in it. I thought he had a one note performance. I mean, he a didn't see- one note performance, tell me what that means. Well, meaning that he really didn't stand out that much. The person who stood out in this was Val Kilmer and probably deserved an Oscar for it. He did a great job. And if people didn't know this, which is a really interesting little tidbit, that Doc Holliday was a great, great relative of Margaret Mitchell, who wrote Gone with the Wind. Hmm. And that's why Val Kilmer put in the Southern accent, which a lot of people thought was cartoony, but I, I thought he was great. I thought it was the best thing Val Kilmer ever did. This movie kept me watching because of Val Kilmer. He was great. And then when we were 
doing our research, I was doing my research, I found out like a lot of these little tidbits, little things that Val Kilmer did. What did you find out? And then I'll tell what I found out. Um, I found out that if you notice Val Kilmer, he takes his, um, during the saloon scene, and he's having a confrontation with Johnny Ringo, and yeah. they're talking Latin. Yes. He's twirling his that little wine cup, it's like I'm twirling a, a stick. Yes. And I thought, oh, okay, maybe that was a thing that Doc Holliday did. But no, that's actually um, iconic of Val Kilmer himself. If you notice, he did that in other films. It's just something that he learned to do with the coin and yes. also with, with the uh, cup that he had. Right. Um, in uh, Top Gun, he also did that with his pen. The coin was a very famous move in old gangster movies, too. Oh. And well, they even I made fun that. of it. And I, I'm going to go off the rails here. Some like rails. it hot. George Raff made fun of it and said, stop doing that cheap trick. Was that, that was sort of like a thing that Val had. And I didn't know that. I thought he was like, that was something like a Doc Holliday did. Um, they have these interactions with... Um, with Johnny Ringo, and they're talking Latin. And these, these little tidbits like that, that make this movie sort of like a cult following. And even like statements that Val made. I mean, people are following them, like our opening dialogue, where I said, you know, we're your Huckleberry. Like he said that three times in the movie, and like, well, what the hell does that mean? You don't know until you do the research afterwards. And people oh, were my doing fingers. that. Um, I didn't mean to point at you, Joe. Don't point at me. I'm not pointing at you. So it's, it's funny because um, your Huckleberry was something that did come from that era, was a saying, um, like, I'm your best, I'm your man, I'm the right. one that can do it. There's another thing that Huckleberry means as well. What does it mean? The caskets where people were buried, the elaborate caskets, the sides that you hold on were called Huckles. I'm challenging you. Huckles. It wasn't pronounced Huckleberry. Huckleberry. It was Huckleberry. Huckleberry. Well, a Huckleberry. Bearer. But it was a Huckle. And there's this infamous so scene. So that's why it correlates with kind of a death thing and also I'm your man. Right. So it had double entendre. Right. Well, let me jump in. Because I got, I'm so excited about this movie. Okay, I'm doing so the research, I got down. excited. I don't want you to get too sweaty. Movie, don't get excited. too sweaty. No, I can't get sweaty here because we're going to like melt away. No. One of the end scenes, or the towards the end, Doc Holley has a gun scene with Johnny Ringo. Johnny Ringo is expecting Wyatt Earp to show up the last time that, you know, he challenges him to a duel. Yes. And Doc Holliday is sick. He's actually bedridden. Doc Holliday wants to help out his friend. And in real life, they were friends, oh, yes. Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp. Uh, but, but he can't get up out of bed. Wyatt Earp gives him a badge, the sheriff's badge, deputizing him as a lawman. Right. It was symbolic. It was to say, you know, twirling. you're okay. You know, you're, you're one of us. Right. Wyatt Earp goes to, the, goes to the location, but Wyatt Earp doesn't realize that Doc Holliday, Val Kilmer, actually goes there ahead of him and in the shadows comes out Doc Holliday. Ringo's like, I didn't think you were going to show up thinking it's Wyatt Earp. No, it's Doc Holliday. And, and he says, and he, he says, knows. I'm your Huckleberry. People thought he also said, I'm your Hucklebearer. And as you said, the Hucklebearer were the, were the, the casket, casket heads, meaning that I'm the one who's going to put you in the ground and put you in a casket. Mm -hmm. In the script, it does say, I'm your Huckleberry. So it really meant, I'm the one that's better than you that's going to put you out. Correct. Let me just interject with that. But Johnny Ringo in real life was not murdered by Doc Holliday. No, he wasn't. Did you know that? Yeah, I did um, know that. And he was found dead leaning against a tree with a single gunshot to the head with his boots off with his horse by nearby mm -hmm. and covered in scorpions. And they, no one ever knew how he died. They thought no. it could have been and how did possibly self-inflicted. How did Doc Holliday get there before Wyatt Earp? Well, again, I mean, he was go back to dead. movies. That's drama. I know, but that's it was drama. like, you know, but that's okay because we like Val Kilmer. He was cool. We yeah, like him. Was, you know what? I always thought Val Kilmer was kind of douchey, but watching this, I actually liked him more. I, I liked him in Batman, but, yeah, but I've never Top seen Gun? this film. Top Gun, that's where I thought he was kind of douchey. Yeah. I started with Kurt Russell. I thought it was one note. I, I just didn't think he was the, you know, uh, Sam Elliott is great. You. you can't keep your I, eyes yeah, off of I him. Can't, I can't agree with you on Kurt Russell. I thought he did a really good job with it. I could see where you could say he was kind of one note. Right. He's kind of pretty much static, but I thought he pulled the film together. Matter of fact, the director. I know what the, you're going to say. The initial director actually was fired. Yes. The new director was brought in. Right. And as... 
we later find out, Kurt Russell supposedly, reportedly, was the one who tried to pull everything together. Right. There was a debate whether Kurt Russell was actually the you know, director behind the scenes. He didn't want to get credit, so he gave it to the, uh, the director, George. Well, first of all, yes. Kevin Jar, who wrote it, was overwhelmed. He just couldn't even handle it. He had the whole thing screwed up from the front, and then they brought but George Cosmatos but in. But, but he wrote He wrote it. it. And one directed, but he screwed the whole and thing was up. He was all time. crazy. Yeah, all crazy because big budget picture. I mean, it wasn't, you know, everybody's salary on this thing. Then they brought George Cosmatos in, who everybody hated him. They hated him. And he didn't direct it well. Matter of fact, he had a big fight with my boyfriend on the set, who you have to guess. And he wouldn't talk to him. They wouldn't talk to each other through the whole film. And Yes, boy. So, and Kurt Russell saved the movie and pretty much directed it. Who's my boyfriend? So I was going to say Sam Elliott. No. But no, it's not. Michael Bearer? Michael Bean. Bean. Bearer? Michael Bean. Bean. Sorry. That's how you pronounce that? Now, Michael Bean, Bean. He's been in a couple pictures we've had. You know Michael Bean from Terminator. He was Kyle. He was in Alien. He was in The Abyss. I think he's gorgeous. Always been in love with him, but he went crazy. Uh. And he's kind of dropped out of film now. Yeah, he did suffer a stroke. I don't know if you know that. Now, I don't know. I didn't know that. I don't even want to know because I love him still. Well, if you want to see some more recent stuff of him, yeah. he was on this YouTube channel, uh, a podcast inside of your clips with Michael Rosenbaum. He was in a couple of clips with him. And there was this one part of the interview where he actually said he couldn't stand George uh, Comatose. Um, that he Cosmatos, talked, not comatose. Comatose? Cosmatose. Cosmatose. <laughs> that he couldn't stand him because he was, he would talk down to the lesser cast. Yeah, he was very um, pedantic, mean to people, like he was superior. But he would kiss ass to people like Kurt Russell, to Val Kilmer. Kurt Russell was top notch at the time, overboard. He did all that stuff, big box office guy. Right. And then later he tried to get to kiss Michael Beans, they say, right? You got it. Ass. But Michael Bean, according to what he said, he goes, you know, I watched this and I didn't like the way he was treating the lower cast. And I, he, one day, George came up to me to say, hey, how you doing? And I turned to him and I said, go f yourself. And I'm like, whoa. And this was right on YouTube podcast. So yeah, yeah. he didn't like him at all. Right. There was also some, you know, rumor that because Michael was friendly with the original director, that he was pissed off that his original director got fired. But finding out that there was only supposed to be three months to film for this movie, mm -hmm. four weeks of it with the original director, and then he got fired and they got rid of all that. There were a zillion stars, like Dana Delaney was in it. I mean, come on, because of China Beach, she's like, what, a person, you don't even know who she is, who you is know? She, she I don't I look her China up, Beach. I know her face, but I went, oh, she was his love interest, mm -hmm. which was like, and then, you know, they had Jason Priestley from 90210. I mean, you know, these people. They Wait, I thought that was Luke Perry. No, he was in uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh. Jason Priestley Wait, was. Wait, the guy who played the, the Billy Breckenbridge. Yeah, that's Sheriff. Jason Priestley. Yeah. Oh, I always get those two mixed up. But anyway, and, and Robert Mitchum narrated the film. He actually was supposed to play the Charlton Heston part, but Robert Mitchum got hurt falling off his horse. So, because he's a big horse person. Well, they all were back then. And he couldn't do it, so he narrated it. But then Char Charlton Heston has a snippet in there. And of course, the second he's on screen, you got to look at him. Unbelievable, you know? Did he part the seas? Well, they were in a desert. They can't no, no seas to part. No, no, there was a very, very. But and if I wanna, you don't uh, know what that means, Gen Zers, look it up. Yes, very famous movie, hokey, but very famous, and it's on Easter. But I want to say one thing. This is so cool. Go ahead. The cool. horse that comes off the train in the beginning that mm -hmm. Kurt Russell grabs because it's being abused mm -hmm. is named Sunday Homespun. And my friend Ray and Joe Ryder from Tacna, Arizona, own Sunday oh, Homespun, wow. who is probably long gone and dead now. But it was the horse? their horse. For him. No, the horse. The horse. Okay. Sunday Homespun. Very famous horse. Very famous stud. You know what's interesting, too? I need to interrupt you. Of, of course. So they... This film took a lot of time, and supposedly it was George Comatose, whatever his name is. Yeah, okay. you got that. me so crazy, I don't know his name, Cosmatose. Yeah, Cosmatose, that he paid a lot of attention, supposedly, to detail. The, you know, the boots, the outfits, 
Supposedly the mustaches. All the men had real mustaches and they used wax to twirl them up. Yeah, Except I for one of the actors and it escapes my mind. Maybe the producers can't put it underneath. There was one that they had to put a mustache. I think I was... thought it was Kurt Russell, but no, you say no. No, Kurt Russell. Well, of course, Sam Elliott, he always has a mustache. Yeah, well, he's born you with a mustache. Hot? He was born with... Do you think he's hot? I said when he did a movie, this is a thousand years ago. He did a movie. entering my space. He did a movie called Lifeguard which was like every girl, young my age, he was a lifeguard on the beach. Yeah. And oh my God, yeah, he was beautiful. But he's not my type. No. I like Michael Bean. Okay. I want him. Okay. Some of the scenes in the movie, Sheriff White gets murdered. You know, later on, you see White Earp trying to bring the perpetrator to justice. And there was this whole scene that, that he got away with it. He was told because the sheriff was in the cahoots with the perpetrator, with the cowboy. Right. And after he got out and then later on you had the the gunfight at the OK Corral and there was this big controversy. Who were the bad guys and who were the good guys? Did Wyatt Earp and his brothers kill these cowboys just on emotion alone or did they actually do something like they killed someone and they were like going to bring law to justice? I didn't know this, but there was a lot of politics involved in Tombstone, which it didn't display in the movie, but you see this um, portrayed in the movie where the townspeople, there's like a march in the center of town. Oh, yeah. With the, no. um, with the people, the cowboys in caskets, and they're trying to make the Wyatt Earp and his brothers look like the villains, and everyone knows it's just justice. Well, do you know politics actually existed in Tombstone? You had Republicans and Democrats, and not that we get involved in politics. There were parties the back then? Yes. I did not yes. know that, yes. Joe. So it, it's it's interesting because... Oh, yeah, because Lincoln and everybody was a Republican. That's right. Yeah, the party... I wonder when the year the party started. That I don't know. I don't know either. But what I know about Tombstone is you had two newspapers. One was like a Democrat-leaning newspaper. One was a Republican-leaning newspaper. And the Democrat-leaning newspaper were on the side of like the Clayton brothers, the Cowboys, saying that the White Earp was... Wow. Because... Organized crime actually helped the industry. It actually helped to fill the saloons. It actually, you know, they knew they were doing something wrong, but they were just kind of letting it go. So the they were getting hand, like paybacks and stuff yeah, back then? Yeah, oh. even the sheriff back then, it's portrayed in the movie, the sheriff that kept on telling, you know, uh, the marshal that was kept on yeah. telling the Wyatt Earp and his brothers, like, oh, you can't do that. Oh, don't go after them. Stop. He was with, he had, was in the cahoots with the organized crime, the, the cowboys. Um, and later on, you find that Wyatt Earp actually wanted to run for office. Okay. And he was, they were trying to work out a deal where the sheriff said, listen, let's not run. You don't run. I'll make you an undersheriff because you got 10% of the profits from the mining industry, the silver mining industry, by being the sheriff. Wow. As a tax. So you got your earnings, and they, they equate that dollar amount to be about a million dollars today. So it was lucrative to be wow. the sheriff. So you kind of wanted to keep things status quo. I just found that fascinating yeah. that things weren't always, you know, clear cut lawmen, weren't always real lawmen. There was politics behind the scenes, sort of like, you know, even today's standards. Oh, it was going back to ancient Rome, for God's sakes. People have been doing this since they started writing on cave drawings. They, they... So as, a, as a, someone who's a historian has to look at these newspapers and looking at the slants, sort of like, again, like today, you're looking at a newspaper, you think, oh, this is today, you know, this is, you know, the way, you know, bad journalism. It was back then, even in the days of. So they of, had the Tombstone Gazette and the Graveyard Sun Times. That's like probably that. what they had, yeah. right? Okay, there that was you go. Interesting. I know. Let me talk about that because we made the first director sound like a nut, but he really, he really was a great writer. He wrote The Devil's Own with Brad Pitt and Harrison Ford was really good about the Irish, you know, uh, underground. And he wrote Glory, which is one of my favorite pictures. And, you know, I just love it. Matthew Broderick, Civil War. And for the kid, for younger demographic, he wrote The Mummy, the Brendan Fraser Mummy. So, you know, he was more of a writer and I think he bit off more than he could chew when he said he was going to direct this monster that had a million people in it and such a huge cast. I mean, the cast rundown at the end of the movie goes on just the cast mm -hmm. for a solid minute to two minutes. They just have everybody in this thing, you know? I'm wondering if at some landmark point, because, you know, you have a movie that was 
back in 93? Yeah. You think it would have happened by now? And if maybe if it did, maybe viewers, you can let us know. But those scenes that Kevin Jarred did when he was director were all cut out of the movie. It would be interesting if they would pull out those scenes just to... Well, you know what he did? What did he do? He made them wear all wool. He was trying to be so authentic. It was 134 degrees when they filmed, and he insisted on it. And everybody was passing out and all crazy. They, were, they had heat stroke, and there were scorpions everywhere. And it was just so uncomfortably unpleasant. It, it sounded like this had a really troubled set, you know? Debbie... Everyone says that Debbie has her thing. Like, Debbie is right. Debbie's watch list. Well, it's time for Joe to have his thing. Okay, so, and then I want to talk about why I hate her like the she movie. Why stop me? No, go ahead. <laughs> she now do it. freaking interrupts me when I'm on a roll. No, go ahead. It's yes. like trying to have it work. Sure and you thing. stop me. <laughs> okay, so my thing Joe is interrupt this. I'm going to have some trivia for you and for the audience. You're, you're welcome to participate. Okay. Called Joe's Thing. All right, fine. But fortunately or unfortunately, some of the trivia you've already answered because you said them during our episode. But I'm going to give you the ones that you didn't oh, say. Oh, Lordy. Are you ready? Yeah, I'll put my thinking okay. cap on. So I'm going to keep it nice and easy. So, um, Biden question. True or false? And audience, play along with us. Was there a connection between Batman and Doc Holliday? True. Do you know why? Because he right. played Batman. No, no. It goes deeper than that. Val Kilmer was born in 1959. The same year, if you remember Adam West. Oh, God, yes. My played, favorite Batman. Adam West played Doc Holliday that year in three different episodes of three different TV series. Colt 45, Sugarfoot, and Lawman. I love Sugarfoot. In 1966, 30 years later, the Batman Forever movie came out. So okay. 30 years after um, 1966 when the Batman sitcom came out, okay, um, Val Kilmer does Batman Forever. Director was uh, director Joel Schumacher was so impressed with his acting debut as Batman yeah. that he had him take the role of Doc Holliday in Tombstone three years later. Very cool. So Adam West. So it's six Holliday. degrees of separation of Val Kilmer. Exactly. So you got that one right. Now I got another one for you. All right, here I go. Okay. There were several lines in the movie Tombstone that referred to a flower, which was historically correct. Do you know which flower? A daisy. Yes. Do you know why? Um, I think because he said, I'm your daisy, like you're like a daisy is a, I'm, I'm sure I'm wrong, but it's like a nice flower. It's simple. It's pure. It's fragile. No, you're wrong. There you go. Debbie's you're half wrong. right, half wrong. You're correct. The flower was Daisy. There are several lines in the movie where he says, when he throws down his cards, Doc Holliday, when he's gambling, and he has the best cards, and he wins the, the bet, and he says, isn't that a Daisy? And then at the, um, when he shoots Johnny Ringo, he goes, you're no Daisy. You're no Daisy at all. Daisy's back then were considered the longest lasting flower. Like if you had a bouquet of flowers, daisies were the strongest one. All right. They stayed alive the longest and their stem stayed rigid. Like they actually was strong. And so they referred to anyone who was a daisy as strong, long living, and you know. Okay. Good to have. Interesting. I learned that. I'm so impressed with Well, myself. I got half right anyway. But you know what? I want to just go over why we gave it this score, okay? You know, uh, I said what I feel. I thought it had a lot of stilted dialogue, and Bruce Boughton, who did the score, I thought it was an awful score. I thought it was overproduced, it was too loud, it was too dramatic, it did. It was boringly dramatic. It had cartoony dramatic scenes where they had the big arc where they had the, his brother got shot, and it was the lightning, and the rain, and the thunder, and oh my God, it was so crazy. And um, I thought the romance that Kurt Russell had when he saw her get out. I don't think she was look like, you know, Barbie or anything. And I thought that was a, like a throwaway, the romance, even though they did have a romance and they did have a long marriage, the people, but it just seemed like a affected subplot. And the women in it, 
we're not, there was no real heavy character development in any of this. You can watch other Westerns and those people could walk into a room and you know what they're going to say and how they're going to act. Mm -hmm. I thought it was very surface Hollywood. I'll tell you though, I liked it more and when I started to do the research and I found that there was actually this whole following because of, a lot of it because of Val Kilmer. Yeah and his role as Doc Holliday because yeah. of these one-liners, because of the historical references, because of things that when you heard it in the movies for the first time, you didn't know what they meant. And people actually followed up for an audience, a, a segment of an audience to follow up to get deeper into that. That struck me as, okay, there's something here. There's some value to that because there are people following it. Um, whether it's a historical reference, whether it's a funny context of the movie, right. you know, so, I'm actually, you know what? I'm going to adjust this. I'm going to give this oh a Lord. 7.5. You know, I'm going up a little bit. at the end, because, it ahead. should be an ass kick and finish where you go, yeah, get those guys, yeah. And also when you check this out, if you go to the critics, okay, the OK Corral and OK. 50% of the people say it's a classic Western, 50% say no. So it's a divided thing. So I, I just feel... They tried to do it. They have the elements of a classic Western, but I just don't feel the weight of something that after you see it, you go, holy cow. The Magnificent Seven, and I'm giving you the 2016 version. I don't care because it's great. Why the new one? It's still the remake of Akira Kurosawa's Kurosawa's Seven Samurai, but it's really well done. And when Denzel was put in, I went, Denzel Washington, I love him. But it was like mixed cast, you know what they're doing now. Great film, character development, ass kicking, you're there like you're sitting at the front of your seat. Number two, Unforgiven, 1992. It's a great revisionist Western with Clint Eastwood, Gene Hackman, and it was the Best Picture winner of 1993. Talk about 1993. Here's the Western of 1993. And revision is challenged, what a revisionist picture is, it challenges the standard of the genre, mm -hmm. but comes out on top. So that's revisionist. Mm -hmm. 310 to Yuma. The new one, 2007, with Russell Crowe, Christian Bale, and the old one. Compare them. Watch both of them if you can. And Amazon has the old one, I'm sure you can see it, with Glenn Ford and Van Heflin. The remake is better, I think. And why? Because it's more textural. You know, in the old days, you didn't have horse poop in the streets. There wasn't sweat. There wasn't this. The costumes were different. They were Hollywood stock. This one is really, really, really well done. And a small town rancher holds a captured outlaw till the train comes. That's what the plot is. And the fifth one, now this is like for younger people, and it has kind of kind of the Brat Pack Young Guns from 1988, Billy the Kid, starring Amelia, make a face all you want, I just put it in because, you know, we got to pander to younger, but I was starring Emilio Estevez, Kiefer Sutherland. We love you, younger audience. And other youngsters of popularity at the time, but the reason it's in there is one of my boyfriends is in it, Terrence Stamp. Ugh. So there you go. That's my watch list. So, Dad, would you recommend this film? I recommend the film because of the stars that are in it. It does have all the classic things that a Western has. But if you want to see something in more depth, and maybe it won't appeal as Costner's Wyatt Earp is more historically accurate. Mm -hmm. and, and But yet, I'm recommending it and just get popcorn to watch it. I think I'm encouraging people to watch it. For me, it's probably a one watcher. I might watch it again now that I've done the research. I want to go back to these little historic references. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I bumped it up a half a point more, because I think they did a great job with the historical references. I think they had a great cast and great performances like Val Kilmer. Yeah, I, I think Dynamite. they created with this movie a really odd but good cult following because they of have. these little inferences. So if they a movie have. can do that, 
I think it's worth watching. Well, before I want to do that, I want to give a shout out because we were supposed to film at a horse barn today. And they were lovely enough to give us horses and a barn, but because of the weather, the potential storm, we're filming at our regular studio. And I want to give a shout out to Carl Zeller's Realty, who owns an 1820, the oldest farm in Homedale. He specializes in selling estates, farms, farmland, and tracts of land. So thank you so much, Carl, for letting us do this. And I'm sorry, but we're going to use your barn in the future. Definitely. I look forward to that. So, you Deb, where are we going well, next? We never know we're going until we go there. Wait, 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 shit, shit. Come on, rule.